So this morning, church, we're going to be in the book of Revelation, and we're going to pick up where we left off. Um, the last time I was up here, we were in the beginning of chapter 3. We started in chapter 2, and we worked our way into chapter 3. Um, but today we're going to be in uh, verses 7 through 13 here in the book of Revelation. And um, we've titled the message this morning, The Faithful Church. So before we get started, let me go ahead and pray over our study, and then we can look at the Word of God uh, together this morning. Well, Heavenly Father, we thank you for this time, Lord. We thank you for the worship. We thank you for just having the ability and the privilege to come here together as brothers and sisters in the Lord. And uh, we just pray this morning, whatever we brought in here with us, we pray that we would lay those things at your feet, at the foot of your cross, Lord, and that our hearts, our minds would be focused on you. Whatever circumstances we've brought in here with us, Lord, we know that you have all of that in your hands and we trust you with it, Lord God. We trust that you're going to heal. We trust that you're going to mend. We trust that you're going to break strongholds. We trust that you're going to do things that are beyond us, Lord God, because you're the God of the impossible, and we truly believe that this morning. Fill us, Lord. Fill this place with your Holy Spirit. Lord, help me to bring forth your word, that I would decrease, Lord, and that you would increase. Just help us, Lord, to learn from you this morning, and help us to leave different from how we came in here. We love you so much, Lord. We praise you, and we thank you once again for this time. We pray these things um, in Jesus' name, amen. So there was once a Scottish evangelist. His name was John Harper. And back in 1910, uh, John Harper was invited to the Moody Church in Chicago, Illinois. And when he went to the Moody Church back in 1910, he was actually very well received. And in fact, a few years later, he was invited back to the Moody Church. Um, he, his sister, and his six-year-old daughter, by that time his wife had passed away, they found themselves on board the RMS Titanic, making their way back to the United States. And as we know, unfortunately, the Titanic hit an iceberg in the middle of the Atlantic Ocean, and it sank within an hour of hitting the iceberg. And many survivors of that fateful voyage report that when the ship began to sink, that Harper immediately got his, his sister and his daughter into one of the lifeboats, and he continued to share the gospel with whomever would listen to him. Eventually, he found himself in the icy waters of the Atlantic, and he had a life jacket on as well. He was said to be floating near another man, and he asked him, hey, are you saved? And this is someone in the middle of the Atlantic about to die. And the guy was like, no, I'm not. So he told him, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ, and you will be saved. Another survivor reported that Harper took off his life jacket and he gave it to another guy. He threw it to him actually, and he said, you need this more than I do. And then a few moments later, he actually sank beneath um, the icy waters there of the Atlantic Ocean. Now, several years later, when many of the survivors reunited to tell their stories, um, the man whom Harper had witnessed to, he told his story of his rescue, and then he gave his testimony um, of his conversion. It was actually recorded on a tract that was called, I Was John Harper's Last Convert. And what we see here is this beautiful story of faithfulness and obedience to an open door for ministry. And regardless of the circumstances or whatever the issue was surrounding that opportunity, you see, John Harper didn't have his eyes on the obstacles or the difficulties that were facing him at the time. He was on a ship that was sinking. He was facing imminent death. But rather, he focused on this open door of evangelism and ministry that the Lord had said before him. And certainly, this is something that we can learn from today as a church. And as we look at the Church of Philadelphia this morning together, we're going to see that they have a similar story in terms of their faithfulness to the Lord and the obstacles that they faced as the Lord opened doors um, for them. So just a little bit of a background here. So far, um, when I've been up here, we've talked a little bit about the church of Ephesus, right? This was a church that had left their first love. We talked about the church of Smyrna. This was the suffering church. We talked about the church of Pergamum, which was the compromising church, the church of Thyatira, which was the corrupt church. And then the last time we talked about Sardis, which was the feeble church. And this morning, we're going to focus on the church of uh, Philadelphia, which is the faithful church. And just a little bit about the city of Philadelphia. And once again, this is not Philadelphia, Pennsylvania. This is Philadelphia, the city, this old city there in Asia Minor. Um, 
Well, this city was located about 40 miles southeast of Sardis. Um, the city itself, the name Philadelphia means love of the brethren or brotherly love. And this was one of the youngest cities out of the seven there in Asia Minor. And it's actually located in modern day al Sahir, Turkey. Okay, so it's the, the, the remnants of the city are still there. And this was a prosperous city in that time. It actually commanded one of the greatest highways in the world. This highway led from Europe to the east. It was literally the gateway from one continent to another continent. And it was often referred to as the gateway to the east. It was also known to have beautiful buildings. Some people called it Little Athens. But unfortunately for Philadelphia, it was over a geologic fault zone. And when you think about that, this place had a bunch of land masses below it that were moving in different directions. So there was a big piece of land to the north called the Anatolian Plate. So this is a piece of land basically moving west. And there were two pieces of land moving into that plate that was moving west. So basically you had earthquakes there all the time. You had some faults that were moving side to side. And faults or pieces of land that were going other, under other pieces of land. So what you had was some normal faulting and strike slip faulting is what they call it. Those of you that are from California, maybe from the western part of the United States, you've experienced earthquakes. Well, this place experienced many, many earthquakes. And in fact, around 17 AD, they experienced a very devastating earthquake that completely destroyed the city. And there was actually some significant damage in Sardis as well. But Philadelphia shook more. They had more severe um, aftershocks, and it destroyed the city. But what we're going to see today is despite all of that, this church had a vision to reach a lost world. And the Lord had set before them an open door for that particular purpose. And unfortunately, they also had some obstacles that they needed to face and overcome in order to do this. And I hope and I pray this morning that this is an encouragement to us as the church, because we're still living in that church age as we continue moving forward in the Lord together. So before we look at the, the Word of God verse by verse, let me go ahead and read the entire text here, and then we can look at this uh, one verse at a time. So Revelation chapter 3, um, beginning in verse 7, and this once again is a letter to Philadelphia. Um, here the Word of God tells us, John writes, Write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. Thus says the Holy One, the true one, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. I know your works. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. Note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not but are lying I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you. Because you have kept my command to endure, I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. Let anyone who has ears to listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. Amen. So the first thing we see here in this letter to Philadelphia, in that very first part of verse 7, is the Lord addresses a specific church, right? He says, write to the angel of the church in Philadelphia. And this is the very, the very same introduction we've seen so far with the other churches that we read about here in, um, in Asia Minor. So once again, he's speaking to this angel, this representative, or perhaps the pastor of this particular church. And then if you move into verse 7, the second part of verse 7, the Lord then introduces himself to the church. He says, Thus says the Holy One, the True One, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. So notice that the Lord reminds us here and the church of Philadelphia this morning that he is holy and that he is true. 
Okay, that's what it says here. And when you think about it, the Lord is holy in his character. The Lord is holy in his words. He's holy in his actions. He's also holy in his purposes. The Lord cannot be compared to anybody or anything else. And we're also reminded here that the Lord is true. Now, the Greek word that is used here for the word true is alathenos, which means real or genuine. So the Lord's real. He's genuine. He's not fake. He's real. He's true to who he is. And in fact, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 5 and 6, there the word of God reminds us, through the Apostle Paul, it says, For even if there are so-called gods, whether in heaven or on earth, are there, are there, there are many gods, excuse me, and many lords. Yet for us, there is one God, the Father. All things are from him, and we exist for him. And there is one Lord, Jesus Christ. All things are through him, and we exist through him. And he is the true and the genuine one, right? He is the true Lord and the true God. And truly the Lord is holy, and truly the Lord is true. And in fact, if you go a little bit later in this book into Revelation chapter 6, there in that 10th verse, the martyrs are crying out this very fact about the Lord. There it says, they cried out in a loud voice, Lord, the one who is holy and true, how long until you judge those who live on earth and avenge our blood? So clearly because he, the Lord, is holy and he, the Lord, is true, he is the one to judge sin and to vindicate his people because of that characteristic or those characteristics that make him and comprise him. Now, as John continues to describe the Lord here, notice he says, the one who has the key of David, who opens and no one will close, and who closes and no one opens. Okay, so there, he's actually quoting from Isaiah chapter 22. If you look in Isaiah chapter 22, um, beginning in verse 20, if you remember there, the Assyrians had invaded Judah, and unfortunately, the Jewish leaders had placed their faith in Egypt and not the Lord to deliver them from that particular situation. And if you remember, one of those awful leaders was Shebna, who abused his power. So the Lord invented, or intervened rather, to replace Eliakim, or put him into authority. And in fact, when you look in Isaiah chapter 22, beginning in verse 20, you think about this guy, Eliakim. He's actually a picture of Christ Jesus himself. So there it says, beginning in verse 20 of Isaiah 22, it says, On that day... I will call for my servant, Eliakim, son of Hilkiah. I will clothe him with your robe and tie your sash around him. I will hand your authority over to him, and he will be like a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. I will place the key of the house of David on his shoulder. What he opens, no one can close. What he closes, no one can open. And once again, this is a beautiful picture of Jesus Christ. So what John is showing us here is he's showing us the Lord's power, the Lord's authority, as we read this description about him. And we know as believers that the Lord himself is the only one that can open and close. And when you think about this particular portion of scripture, what they're referring to is doors. And when you think about open and closed doors, those are things that only the Lord can do. And I think sometimes as believers, we want to open those doors ourselves, right? The Lord closes a door and we want to open a window, but we got to be careful with that, right? When the Lord closes a door, that's a time where we have to just wait. And whenever we see an open door, whenever we hear about an open door, as believers, that is an opportunity to serve the Lord. That's an opportunity um, for ministry. And in fact, the Apostle Paul talks about this, for example, in 1 Corinthians chapter 16, and also, Luke talks about this in Acts chapter 14. But the Lord is the one who gives those opportunities. He's also the one who determines who and how they will go and fulfill those opportunities. And we have to be careful because sometimes we can get ahead of the power and the person of the Holy Spirit, and we want to open those doors ourselves and do those things, fulfill those things in the flesh. And it's not possible. And I think we've seen this in the church before where maybe people come in here and they want to start opening doors for themselves to serve in capacities that the Lord has not allotted them to do so. And we have to be careful with that. And, you know, when I was reading this, it kind of reminded me of several years ago. I remember I was in a, I was in a class somewhere and this young lady got very upset with the, 
the teacher, the professor, I don't know who it was, and she stormed out of the room, but the door, you had to push it to open the door. So she started pulling on the door, and she was tugging and tugging at the door, and then the professor was like, you need to push the door. And she got very angry, and she kicked the door open and, and left the room. But we can't do that with the doors that the Lord has put before us. We can't tug at them. We can't kick them open. We have to just wait until he opens them. You have to be patient. But only the Lord can do that. We'll talk a little bit more about that in the next verse. But anything that is done apart from the Lord is going to fail. And anything that is done in the Lord, nobody is going to stop. So those are things that we can confide in um, this morning. And as we'll see in just a little bit, like I said, the Church of Philadelphia... They had a few obstacles to overcome in order to walk through those doors, those opportunities that the Lord had um, brought before them. Now, if you look at verse 8, the Lord shares with this particular church what he knows about them. So it says here, I know your works. Look, I have placed before you an open door that no one can close because you have but little power. Yet you have kept my word and have not denied my name. And as we've seen with the other churches so far, the Lord knew everything about them. He knew their works. He knew everything, just like he knows everything about this church, right? He knows everything. And those are things that we have to remember, like the Lord sees everything. He knows everything, right? And he saw that too. I'm just kidding. <laughs> he sees everything. Um, so the Lord has set before an open door for this church that no one can shut. Okay, and as we described this before, open doors are those doors for evangelism, ministry, whatever it is that the Lord wants us to do. Now, in the case of Philadelphia, one scholar puts it this way. He says, in its history, Philadelphia had a great evangelistic calling. The city had the mission of spreading Greek culture and language through the whole region. Now Jesus opened the door for the Christians of Philadelphia to spread the culture of his kingdom through the whole region. Now notice when he tells them about the door, he says, look, right, look, I have placed before you an open door. And often when the Lord opens doors for us, we miss them because we're not looking. And that's very important to us this morning as a church. We need to be looking for those doors, for those opportunities to serve and to minister. And we need to walk through those doors out of obedience and out of faith. And sometimes it's difficult because we don't have that obedience. We don't have that faith. We have a lot of fear and anxieties. But we have to overlook those obstacles and walk through those doors. After all, the Lord is the one who opened the door. He's the one who has the authority and the control to keep that door open. Another thing we have to remember, and I mentioned it just a little bit here, is the Lord is the one who opens those doors, and he's the one who promotes. He's the one who chooses who will walk through those doors, right? If you look in the book of Psalms, Psalm chapter 75, for example, beginning in verse 6, it says, For exaltation comes neither from the east, nor from the west, nor from the south, but God is the judge. He puts down one, and he exalts another. So the Lord is the one who promotes. He chooses who will walk through those doors, but also, as we walk through those doors, as we serve and we're in different positions of servitude in the church, everyone needs to remember that we're all replaceable, right? We can't get to a point where we're serving and we find ourselves or we think of ourselves as something when we're really nothing because the Lord will replace us, right? We're all replaceable and everyone is promoted only by the Lord. We can't promote ourselves. And then notice here in verse 8, he, he writes this interesting phrase regarding um, the fact that the Lord is the one who opens doors and closes doors. He says, because you have little power. He tells, him the he tells the church here, you have little power. Now, what does he mean by this? Now, when you think about this particular church, it wasn't necessarily a very large church. It wasn't very, a very strong church, but it was a faithful church. Okay, And they were true to God's word. They were unafraid to bear um, his name. And I love this because it reminded me so much of our church, Fresh Vision Calvary Chapel. And what we need to remember is it's not the size of a church or the strength of a church that determines its ministry, but rather it's the faith in the calling and the command of the Lord that determines its ministry. 
And that's what we need to look, be looking towards. Not so much the numbers, but the quality of faith that the members actually have. That's what's important. And just like the church in Philadelphia, I know in my heart that if the Lord opens up a door for us to serve, that he's going to give us what we need to walk through that door. And I can tell you, I've seen that happen at this church many, many times. And I know he'll continue to do those things for us. But we have to be faithful and continue to walk through those doors with obedience and with faith that he's given to us. This kind of reminded me of Gideon. And um, you guys know Gideon, right? That guy who was a little insecure. He reminds me of myself quite a bit, actually. Um, thankfully in the Lord, I'm not as insecure as I am in the flesh. But um, if you look back in the book of Judges, chapter 7 and chapter 8, if you remember there, an army of some 50,000 Midianites invaded Israel for the purposes of hijacking their food, right? Like they went and they stole like their frijoles and their rice, right? They took all their food away. Um, as a result of this, a judge named Gideon, he called on the people of Israel to gather and a good 30,000 men showed up to form an army. And clearly that was enough people to, to defeat, to destroy the Midianites. Um, however, the Lord had another plan, right? He commanded Gideon to downsize the army. So they went from 30,000 to 20,000. And the reason that, that happened is because those that were afraid, those that were having some second thoughts, they were allowed to leave, right? And then with about 10,000 left, the Lord commanded further downsizing of the army. And if you remember, he commanded Gideon to take these men to the river to drink, right? Some of them stuck their faces in the water. Others kneeled and they took the water with their hands and they drank it. And it was that latter group, those that had kneeled and, and received the water with their hands and drank it, that made up that final 300-member army. And when you think about 300 people, um, you know, it's about the average size of like a college marching band. So you think it's a lot of people, right? But it really isn't when you compare it to the army of the Midianites there. And what we see here is that 2% of the, the 15,000 member Midianite army was able to miraculously defeat them. And that's all because of the Lord. And this was God's doing and not their own. So downsizing Gideon's army was a way of showing this, that all the power, all the might, all the ability came from the Lord. And in the battle we face today as a church, in the world, it's not the number of saints that counts, but rather the quality of faith and obedience in those saints to the Lord that's going to count. And I love our church. I'm so grateful for this church because we have so many faithful servants here and we can serve and we can grow together and we can do great things for the Lord. Even though there's few of us, if we're mighty in the Lord, nothing and no one can stop us. And I remember, I remember like a long time ago, my dad told me, he's like, you know, you get a bunch of flakes together, you can have an avalanche. And it's true. And if you get enough flakes in this room that follow the Lord, man, we can win the city. And that's something we've got to have in our hearts every single day. Um, we're nothing, but together in the Lord, we're something. And um, every single day, we've got to look for those opportunities because it's the Lord's work, it's the Lord's doing. And when you think about the Church of Philadelphia, they had this evangelistic opportunity. The Lord had opened this door for them. They had reliance on God, right? They were not mighty or strong in their power. They were faithful. They kept his word. They did not deny him. And this is a beautiful example of a church to us this morning that we want to model. It's a great example. Now, in verse 9, and also read verse 10, what we see here is the Lord shares what he will do for the Christians of Philadelphia. So he says, note this, or, or John writes, note this, I will make those from the synagogue of Satan who claim to be Jews and are not, but are lying, I will make them come and bow down at your feet, and they will know that I have loved you because you have kept my command to endure. I will also keep you from the hour of testing that is going to come on the whole world to test those who live on the earth. So in this city, unfortunately, there was a group of persecuting Jews. Um, he describes them as individuals from the synagogue of Satan, is what he calls them. Um, and they were causing some issues there for the, the church in Philadelphia. If you remember back in chapter 2 of Revelation, this was, was a while back when we talked about the church of Smyrna, they also were facing some persecution, if you remember. Um, 
and they were facing some pretty significant persecution. But here we see the same thing with Philadelphia. And this group of persecutors, they actually had no spiritual connection to Abraham or to the people of faith. They were just Jews um, by name. And when you think about it, all Jewish people have a great heritage. However, that's not enough to guarantee salvation. And when you think about this, it reminded me of John the Baptist. Remember John the Baptist, that radical guy in the wilderness? I don't know. I picture this guy with dreadlocks and like a hippie, but I don't know. He's doing the Lord's work, right? So that doesn't matter. But remember what he told the unrepentant Pharisees and the Sadducees of his time? He called them a brood of vipers, right? Which is basically the offspring of snakes. He called them baby snakes, right? Is what he called them. And if you look in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 3, verse 9 and verse 10, it says, and don't presume, he's telling these guys this, don't presume to say to yourselves, we have Abraham as our father. For I tell you that God is able to raise up children for Abraham from these stones. The axe is already at the root of the trees. Therefore, every tree that doesn't produce good fruit will be cut down and thrown into the fire. And the same can be, tr can, can be true for us as well. Just because we come from a Christian family doesn't mean we get an automatic ticket into the kingdom of God, right? We are responsible to have our own relationship with Jesus Christ. We have to be responsible for that. This nation claims to be a Christian nation. But when you think about the laws, the behaviors, the darkness that is filling this country at this time, I think it's very far from a Christian nation. It tells a completely different story. We need to be in prayer for this country every single day. Now, in the midst of this persecution, the Lord reminded them that he loved them, and the persecutors would know that he loved the church there in Philadelphia. And he'll tell us in a little bit what he's going to make them do. But what we need to remember is in the midst of persecution, in the midst of affliction, difficult times in our lives, faith sees opportunities, but unbelief sees obstacles, okay, whenever we face these difficulties. And it kind of reminded me of Abraham and Isaac. And I know in the men's group, we talked about this a long time ago, but you see, Abraham was able to overlook those obstacles, right? When the Lord told him to sacrifice his only son, Isaac. And you could imagine that must have been a difficult thing for him. This was his only son that he and Sarah had waited so long um, to have. Even she laughed about it. She didn't believe she was going to have a son. But it was his faith and the practice of his faith that allowed him to overlook that painful obstacle of losing his only son, all because he had his mind on the Lord and not on the pain he had his eyes on that open door of obedience, right? He was looking to this. And it also opened up some ministry opportunities for him. We'll talk a little bit about that in just a second here. But of course, we know that this story didn't end with a sacrifice of Isaac, right? It was just a test. And he ended up, he, he didn't end up sacrificing Isaac. Um, but it was necessary for him to go through all these things. And you're like, well, why? Well, only God knows, right? But I truly believe that this opened even more doors for him to grow in the Lord and also for, to minister perhaps to the people around him, including his wife, Sarah. And those are things that he looked for as he went through this difficult time. And I know this morning that many of my brothers and sisters in the Lord were facing some difficult things this morning, whether it's your health, whether it's you know, finances, Whatever it is, maybe it's, it's depression. The Lord knows what you're facing. And I can tell you there have been many, many seasons in my life where I've had to keep my eyes on the Lord and not on the obstacle. And this is especially true when it's come, when it's, you know, come to my health. Um, the Lord has brought constant um, lessons and, and things that I've learned from all of that. But my advice to you this morning, if you're facing a difficult time, is don't ask the Lord why he's allowing this to happen to you but rather ask the Lord what he's trying to teach you through all of that. Look for those doors that he's opening in this time of affliction and difficulty where you can minister to people, you can minister to other people because the Lord is ministering to you. Use that to help others as well to get through their struggles. I know often, particularly with illness, it leads to isolation, but isolation is what the enemy loves. He likes to isolate, to separate from the body, to separate from the Lord, to become independent of God. But don't isolate. We need each other. And use this time of, of affliction to help others grow as the Lord is helping you grow. And keep your eye on those open doors. And I read a quote. Um, it was this morning. And I put it in my phone because I didn't have time to add it to my notes. 
and I'll read it to you. I'm not on TikTok, I promise. I'm actually reading a quote. <laughs> my students, oh, I'm, I'm checking my grades. They're on TikTok. All right, so Spurgeon quote. So Spurgeon, you know, similarly as we, as we just talked here, he says, I thank God that I have undergone fearful depression. I know the borders of despair and the horrible brink that dark gulf of that dark gulf rather into which my feet have almost gone because of this i have been able to help brothers and sisters in the same condition i believe that the christian's darkest and most dreadful experiences will lead them to follow christ and become fishers of men keep close to your lord and he will make every step a blessing and certainly these dark times in his life they opened up doors for him. They gave him opportunities to minister to people, to show them the hope and the future that he had in Christ Jesus. And that's how we should approach these things. And going back to the Church of Philadelphia, in the midst of their persecution, they too needed to keep looking up. Because we, as we just read, the Lord promised them that he would take care of their enemies. And for us this morning, remember, brothers and sisters in the Lord, that the Lord loves you, even in the midst of that hard time that you're going through. He's doing things in your life that you don't even know. You may never know until you see him face to face. Use these times, these times of affliction as opportunities to grow and to help others grow and walk through those doors that he opens for you with boldness. Now, as we read right now, remember he told them that he would allow their enemies or he would make their enemies bow down at you. He says, I will make them come and bow down at your feet and they will know that I have loved you, right? This is speaking of those persecuting Jews, he tells the church of Philadelphia this regarding them. And this kind of reminded me of what we read in Isaiah chapter 45. If you look in Isaiah 45 verse 14, here God promised Israel that the Gentiles would honor them and acknowledge their God. And he says here in Isaiah 45 14, this is what the Lord says, the products of Egypt and the merchandise of Cush and the Sabines, men of stature, will come over to you and will be yours. They will follow you. They will come over in chains and bow down to you. They will confess to you. God is indeed with you, and there is no other. There is no other God. But now in this case, the tables have turned. And in this case, the persecuting Jews, they will now take the place of the heathen and acknowledge that Jesus Christ is the Lord God. And similarly, if you look in 1 Corinthians chapter 14, verses 24 through 25, the Lord tells a similar thing regarding the unbelievers of the Apostle Paul's time. If you remember there, the Apostle Paul was addressing the church in Corinth. He was correcting them. They had been abusing the gift of tongues, and he told them that it was better for them to prophesy. And as a, as a result of prophesying, unbelievers would bow down in the midst of Christians to worship God, or they would worship God in the presence of Christians. And we know as believers that one of these days, every knee will bow and every tongue will confess that Jesus Christ is Lord and they will praise him. And we see this promise given to the saints there regarding these persecuting Jews in the city of Philadelphia. Now, the Lord also tells them, um, since they have remained faithful to his word and have endured, they would also be spared from an hour of trial that would come upon the whole world. Okay, that's what he tells them. And you're probably thinking, well, what is he speaking of, this hour of trial? And um, what does he mean? Well, when you study this verse, many scholars suggest that he's referring to the great tribulation period. Okay? If you look at Revelation chapter 17, you look there in verse 8. There John documents for us. It says, the beast that you saw was and is not and is about to come up from the abyss to go to destruction. Those who live on the earth whose names have not been written in the book of life from the foundation of the world will be astonished when they see the beast that was and is not and is to come. So in this portion of scripture here in, in Revelation chapter 17 verse 8, what's being referred to or what is being spoken of here is the Antichrist, right? And this individual is not going to be revealed until the great tribulation period or time. So if you're looking for the Antichrist right now, you're wasting your time. you got to be looking to Jesus. Okay, that's going to happen later. All right, we're not even going to be here. Um, I'll talk more about that in just a second. But the term there that says those who live on the earth 
is the same term that we just read here in Revelation chapter 2, verse 9 and verse 10. So what it, this hour of testing, once again, is referring to unbelievers, not Christians, right? We're not going to be here during that time. We're either going to be raptured, right, before this happens, if we're still living, or we're already going to be in the presence of the Lord through physical death. So we won't be here for that. And remember, we have not been appointed to wrath. 1 Thessalonians 5.9 tells us, For God did not appoint us to wrath, but to obtain salvation through our Lord Jesus Christ, who died for us, so that whether we are awake or asleep, we may live together with him. Therefore, encourage one another and build each other up as you, already, um, as you are already doing. Another thing to remember as believers, we're not dwellers of this earth, guys. We're pilgrims, right? This earth is not our home. Philippians 3.20, Paul tells us, our citizenship is in heaven, and we eagerly wait for our Savior from there and the Lord Jesus Christ. So once again, because of their faithfulness to the word and their faithfulness to endure in the Lord, they're going to avoid all of this difficult period, this hour of trial that the Lord will bring upon the earth to those that have not received him into their lives that are still remaining. Um, so that's a beautiful promise and a reminder for us all. You know, as we go through difficulties, let's, let's, uh, let's put that into perspective. What we face right now is so small. This life is but a vapor. There's so much more hope and future left for us in Christ Jesus this morning. And I truly believe the best is still um, yet to come. Amen. Amen. Now, if you look in verse 11, Paul continues. I'm sorry, not Paul. John continues. And he talks about what the Lord expects of the church there in Philadelphia. So if you look in verse 11, he says, I am coming soon. Hold on to what you have so that no one takes your crown. And when I read this verse, it was very reminiscent of what the Lord tells us in Revelation chapter 22, verse 12. There he says, look, I am coming soon, and my reward is with me to repay each person according to his work. So just as the church there in Philadelphia needed to remember, church, I think we need to be reminded often too that the Lord is coming quickly, and uh, we must be prepared for his soon arrival. We have to live um, with this healthy fear of an imminent return, like the Lord could come back right now, he could go back tomorrow, he could go back any, any moment. We don't know. And in fact, if you look in the Gospel of Matthew, chapter 24, verse 36, it says, Now concerning that day and hour, no one knows, neither the angels of heaven nor the Son, except the Father alone. So not even Jesus knows when he's coming back. Only his Father knows when he's coming back. And as a result of this, they, the believers there in Philadelphia, are told to hold fast to what they had. And what they had, we just read about, it was described in verse 8, right? They had an evangelistic opportunity. The Lord had opened this door for them. They had reliance on God. And they had faithfulness to the Lord. They had kept his word. They hadn't denied his name. And they're told to do these things. And he says here, so that no one takes your crown. Now, what does this mean, take my crown or take their crown? Well, the Greek word that is used here for crown is stephanos. Okay, if you look up that word stephanos in the concordance, it means the eternal blessedness which will be given as a prize to the genuine servants of God in Christ. So what this is, it's those heavenly rewards that we've spoken of before. Those five crowns that we, we read about in the word of God. So for example, the imperishable crown that we read about in 1 Corinthians chapter 9, the crown of rejoicing, which is the crown we read about in 1 Thessalonians chapter 2, the crown of righteousness, 2 Timothy chapter 4, the crown of glory in 1 Peter chapter 5, and the crown of life that we've read about in Revelation chapter 2. Well, the idea here is not that their crown would be stolen by somebody else, but rather given to somebody else. Because the truth of the matter is, if anyone's going to steal our crowns, it's going to be us. And what I mean by that is, if we miss an opportunity to minister, if we miss an opportunity to serve the Lord, we're the ones that have stealed that opportunity away from ourselves. Proverbs chapter 4, 23 tells us to guard our hearts above all else, for it is a source of life. So our hearts have to be in unity with the Lord. We need to stay busy in the Lord, doing the Lord's work, and also be watchful for, those, for his imminent return and those opportunities. 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 58 tells us, Therefore, 
My dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. And I, I truly believe this morning that as we serve the Lord, you know, he's going to remember all these things, right? The word of God tells us all these things are going to pass through the fire of judgment. And what we do for the Lord, only what we do for the Lord, guys, is going to count. So we need to be careful where we waste our time laboring. Is it in the Lord? Is it for the Lord? Is it for things that are temporary? Because that's going to matter. You know, Pastor Chuck used to always say, you have only one life and it will soon be passed, but only what's done for Christ will last. And that's so true. And we got to be busy in the Lord. And this is what the Lord is telling the church here in Philadelphia. And we need to stay busy in the Lord. And when we do that, the Lord's going to reward us. And in fact, he tells this to the church there in Philadelphia. He promises them a reward. If you look in verse 12, he says, The one who conquers, I will make a pillar in the temple of my God, and he will never go out again. I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God in my new name. And what a beautiful promise to endure. The Lord would make them a pillar in the temple of God. And you guys, I know you guys have seen pillars before, and maybe you've seen some really bad pillars before. Um, but when you think about a pillar, okay, think of this as a picture of strength, a picture of beauty, stability, and dignity. And as we discussed earlier, this place, they had a lot of earthquakes there. Okay, so whenever the city was destroyed, the only thing that remained was the pillars that were holding up the buildings. And what was holding up the pillars was the foundation. And as believers, our foundation needs to be in Christ Jesus. That way, as pillars of the church, as he rewards us, we need to continue standing, even though the world may be falling around us. And we know that in Christ Jesus, we can stand firm because the world, guys, it's literally crumpling around us. It's falling apart around us. And we, we shouldn't be so concerned about that because it's expected, but it should give us an urgency to share the love of Jesus Christ and to love the people around us and to continue remaining steadfast in that foundation. Two pillars of the church support the church and they look to Jesus as their support foundation, regardless of what's going on around them. And that should be all of us this morning. We need to tap into God, not tap out of him, but tap into him. Now, furthermore, we're told that in Christ, um, he tells them that they will never go out again, right? He will never go out again is what he says. And what you want to think about when he, when he says this is permanence and stability in God that will always remain. Now, going back to the earthquakes that this city used to have, every time there was an earthquake and the city started to crumble, people would run out of the city. They would flee. And then once the earth stopped shaking, they would come back. And in Christ, guys, we don't have to play that game, Right? Because in Christ, we will always have permanent stability, even when the earth is moving and the world around us is shaking and falling apart. And in this life, I know and you know that there's no stability in the world. If you're outside of the Lord and in the world, there's no stability. There's, there's always chaos and, and you're just never going to find stability or hope or, or peace. And in this life, we have to focus on the Lord. The stability and the only stability we have, the only hope we have, and the only future we have is in, in Christ Jesus. And then notice the last thing he says to them. He says, I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, which comes down out of heaven from my God and my new name. So those that overcame also received these names. Okay, and you're like, well, what do these names mean? Well, in those ancient cities, in those times, often they honored great leaders by erecting pillars and putting their names on these pillars. They would inscribe them. And these names that are spoken of here are marks of who we belong to, our identity in the Lord. And these names also mark our intimacy with the Lord because we know him in ways that others may not know, know him. And I know for me, the most intimate and personal moments and times I've had with the Lord have been in those dark seasons in my life. And those are the seasons and those, those times and difficulties where the Lord has given me opportunities to grow and slowly turn me into that pillar that he wants me to be. And he's doing the same for you guys this morning and always. Now, as we move into the last verse, verse 13, he finally ends with an exhortation. 
And if you remember, in, um, the other, the, for the other churches, the other uh, five churches we've spoken of so far, he does the same thing, right? So in verse 13, he says, Let anyone who has ears to hear listen to what the Spirit says to the churches. So once again, um, he said this to the other churches as well. But this morning, as we read this together, I don't want you to think that this message is just for like some ancient church from a long time ago. This is actually for us today as well. In this current church age, we're still in the church age. And this is very important that we hear these things and we take heed this morning, learning so much from this church here in Philadelphia. So bringing all of this to a close this morning, I truly believe that the praise and the encouragement that the Lord gave to the church there in Philadelphia is something that we as a church today want to hear also. The truth is the church today is like the church of Philadelphia, right? God has said before us, open doors, an opportunity. If he opens doors, we need, need to work, right? We need to walk through those doors out of obedience and out of faith. And then when the Lord closes a door, don't open a window, guys. Wait. I'm sorry, you were drinking something. <laughs> yeah, don't open a window. You know, wait for that door to be open. Um, and we have to wait on the Lord. Above everything, we need to be faithful to him and see the opportunities and not the obstacles, just like the Church of Philadelphia did this morning. We must stay on the foundation of Christ. That way we can stand firm, even when the ground and the world starts shaking and moving around us. We must be dependent on our own strength. We must not, rather, depend on our own strength, but on the strength of the Lord. And that will help us focus on the opportunities that God has set before us. It is when we miss those opportunities, guys, that... We're going to lose those heavenly rewards. We don't want to do that. We want to, we, want to, we want to win people for the Lord. Of course, he's going to do the work, right? We're just the messengers. We're just the vessels. We can't change people, you know? We can only be the, the voice, the mouthpiece, the individual that the Lord can use. And when we do miss those opportunities as children of God, we are, in a sense, not fulfilling what he called us to do. If you look in 1 John chapter 2, verse 28, the word of God tells us there. So now, little children, remain in him so that when he appears, we may have confidence and not be ashamed before him at his coming. And we don't want to be ashamed before the Lord, but rather we want to hear those words, well done, good and faithful servant. I know that's my heart. After all, God's pillars are not made of stone, but rather faithful people who bear his name for his glory. And then I'll close with this from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, 58. Therefore, my dear brothers and sisters, be steadfast, immovable, always excelling in the Lord's work, because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Amen? So this morning, um, I want to give you an opportunity to give your life to Jesus Christ. And, um, you know, the Lord knows your hearts this morning. I don't know everyone's heart this morning. And if you're watching on the live stream, you come across us at a later time. I don't know where your heart is this morning, but we do want to give you that opportunity. If you are tired of wrestling with this world as it crumples around us, as it continues to shake violently, and you want to stand firm on something or someone who will never leave you, never forsake you, you want a loving father in your life, we want to give you that chance. We want to give you that opportunity. So if that's you this morning, if you could close your eyes and bow your head and just say this prayer with me. But you have to mean this with your whole heart. This is not just your lip service onto the Lord. Because he sees and he knows everything. So if that's you this morning, you can just repeat this prayer with me. Well, Heavenly Father, this morning I do want to declare your son Jesus Christ as my Lord and Savior. And Jesus, I do believe that you are the Son of God. I believe that you died for my sins. I believe that you were buried. And I believe that you rose from the dead three days later. Lord, I know that I am a sinner in need of a Savior. Please forgive me of my sins. Fill me with your Holy Spirit, Lord. Change me and shape me. And please use me for your glory. We pray these things and I ask these things in Jesus' name. Amen. And if you prayed that this morning, um, you know, the Word of God tells us in, in um, the Gospel of Luke, in the, in the 14th or the 15th chapter, that even when one person um, repents and turns to the Lord, there's a celebration in heaven on your behalf. And the angels are celebrating on your behalf. And if you're watching on the live stream and maybe you need more information about a Bible teaching church, maybe you need a Bible, maybe you need prayer, anything like that, please reach out to the church. We meet every Sunday at 10 a.m. Um, our church is located at 4242 Hondo Pass. Um, it's the intersection of Gateway South and, um, and Hondo Pass here in Northeast El Paso. 
And um, just, just contact us. If you want to leave a comment there on the YouTube video, you can do that as well. Um, we're here for you. We're, we're going to be praying for you throughout the week. We love you, and we hope to see you again uh, soon here. So bye for now.